grateful on first Sunday especially to say thank you to Jesus. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to give God just a little bit of praise. My brothers and my sisters, on this first Sunday of the month of August, it is now preaching time. Let us come before the throne of grace and ask God to bless us in this preaching moment. Precious and wonderful God, I thank you for the opportunity to stand once again behind this sacred and consecrated desk. I thank you, dear God, for what your son Jesus the Christ did on Calvary's cross on a Friday, but I also thank you, dear God, for the miracle that you pulled off on a Sunday. So, dear God, this morning we come before you as we prepare our hearts and our minds to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, praying for your blessings, praying, dear God, that you will intercede in our hearts and in our lives, and praying, dear God, that our actions will be pleasing unto you. Now, these and all of the blessings we ask in the precious and perfect name of Jesus. Amen. Please join me this morning as we prepare to preach God's Word in the Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter, the 13th through the 16th verses. Popular passage of Scripture told to us uniquely by the author of Matthew, his fifth chapter, the 13th through the 16th verses. And I'll be reading this morning from the New Revised Standard Version of the Holy Bible. Hear now the words of Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light, I'm talking about you, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory, not to you, but to your Father in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For just a few moments this morning, my brothers and my sisters, I, I want to talk with you from the topic, walk in your destiny. Walk in your destiny. I want to take a moment to again say thank you to the members of this wonderful church for your consideration and your kindness over the course of the last few weeks as I have had to deal with my mother's transition from labor to reward. I am so thankful that God allowed me to get back to New Orleans in time, to hold my mother's hand, to pray with my mother, and to give thanks for a lifetime of precious memories that will never be absent from my heart. I'm also especially thankful because as I think back about my childhood sitting on my mother's lap, as I think about hugging my mother, and especially in later years, I think about holding my mother's precious hand. My mother left for me a wedding ring as a physical reminder of the unconditional love we will always share. Now, my mother was a gifted educator, and quite frankly, she was able to walk in her destiny because God allowed her to meet students where they were and to help them reach their God-given potential to grow and to become the people that God wanted them to be. I'm proud to share that in addition to being my mother and my sister Deborah's mother, our mother was also a mother figure to so many. That's because God allowed her to use the gift she was giving while always giving praise, honor, and glory unto God to walk in her destiny. Now, on Friday, July the 17th, shortly after leaving my mother at the cemetery with my father, we went back to my sister's house and we ate one of my mother's favorite foods, New Orleans-style catfish. Y'all don't hear me? 
As we were decompressing and watching TV and talking about God's many blessings, the news broke about two other soldiers of the cross who were called on that very day to transition from the church militant to the church triumphant. The Reverend C.T. Vivian and United States Congressman John Robert Lewis. As I thank God for allowing my mother to be able to walk in her destiny, I also had to thank God for allowing the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Lewis to walk in their destinies too. As faithful and selfless servants who cared more about others and looked at the bigger picture of serving community and much less at the smaller picture of advancing individuality, we can call their names as individuals who walked in their destinies. But we can also call the names of others who walked in their destinies too. We can call names like Thurgood Marshall and Constance Baker Motley. We can call out names like Martin Luther King Jr. and Benjamin Elijah Mays. We can call names like Arthur Ashe and Jackie Robinson, like Duke Ellington, Paul Robeson, and Charles R. Drew. But watch this. Walking in your destiny is not just for those who lived in the past. Walking in your destiny is just as much for those of us who are living right now. That means whenever you do good for others, whenever someone who professes to be a Christian stops and tries to live a life that is Christ-like, you too are walking in your destiny. That means walking in your destiny isn't just for Barack Obama or Andrew Young. It's not just for Kamala Harris or Sherry Beasley. Walking in your destiny is just as much for why oh you. Whenever you do the best you can with what you have, you give honor and glory to God and praise unto God. And ultimately, as members of the church, that means we're walking to achieve our greatest destiny. The message I hope to share with you this morning in the sermon is about using the gifts God has given you and using your actions to glorify God. That's the highlight of this message, and it's also the highlight of the message Jesus shared in Matthew in his famous sermon on the mount. When we look at the text now, we're preaching this morning from what is recorded as Jesus' first sermon, told to us exclusively by the author of Matthew. Now, Jesus' extended discourse occupies the entirety of chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew, and it's often called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, in following Matthew's chronological sequence, we recognize that after the infancy narratives in chapters 1 and 2 comes our introduction to Jesus' first cousin, John the Baptist, in chapter 3. Followed by chapter 4, where Jesus is in the wilderness preparing for his ministry just before he calls his first disciples. Now, here in chapter 5, Jesus is starting to preach. To put this sequence in the context of a minister in the AME church, Jesus has accepted his ministry. He's passed all of the tests that have been given by the board of examiners. He's been to annual conference. Bishop gave him a church, and now it's Sunday morning, yeah. and it's preaching time. In preaching this first sermon now, Jesus is giving us some of the most fundamental tenets of our theology and guideposts of our Christian faith. As one of the most widely quoted portions of the New Testament, you are familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. It's where Jesus gives us the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's where Jesus gives us instructions on how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And the portion we're preaching from this morning is Jesus' metaphor on salt and light, a formula to help us all do what I like to call walk in our destiny. Now, in following this metaphor on salt and light and trying to apply it to our everyday lives, I believe this portion of the Sermon on the Mount teaches us three particular points or three specific things. The first thing it teaches us is 
No matter what your circumstances look like, no matter how rough things may be, no matter what's going on around you, don't you ever lose sight of who you are. The second point it teaches us, again, in the midst of your circumstances, let your light shine in the midst of your situation. The third thing it teaches us, tell somebody else. Mm -hmm. I know you know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Tell somebody else about the goodness of God. <laughs> the first point Jesus is teaching us in this text is that regardless of your circumstances, regardless of how difficult things may seem, part of walking in your destiny means don't you ever lose sight of who you are. When we look at the text now in, in verse 13, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? In other words, if Jesus was having a conversation with our sister Angela Bassett, he might just ask her, Stella, how did you get your groove back? By using a metaphor for salt, in talking to this congregation of people, Jesus is reminding them about the functionality of an everyday substance that was essential for everyday life. Salt was not only used to season food, salt was also used to preserve food. And because Jesus didn't live in a society with the creature comforts of refrigerators and microwaves, salt had an essential function of preserving foods for extended periods of time. Now, here's the catch. Salt is no longer good for its essential functions of seasoning or preservation if it becomes so diluted by the things around it, if it becomes so diluted by things that are not salt, that it can no longer fulfill its purpose. In other words, salt has got to be salt. Meaning, in the context of a lunchtime meal, salt can't perform the function of the pepper because the salt has got to be the salt. Salt can't substitute for the bread because salt is still salt. Salt can't be the meat because salt was made to be salt and salt cannot substitute for the drink. Salt has a particular function because notwithstanding everything else, it was made to be salt. What are you saying, preacher? Hmm? Just like salt has a primary function, as members of the church, you and I have got a primary function too. That means in season and out of season, in good times and in bad. As members of the church, no matter how things may look, no matter how much we may be detoured by the immediacy of our situation, our primary purpose in the church is always to praise God. Praise God through everything you're going through. Just take a minute and praise God. Praise God at the cemetery by giving thanks to God for a life well lived. Praise God when you're marching across a bridge in Selma, Alabama, if you really believe that all God's children deserve the right to vote. Praise God regardless of your circumstances because you can use those circumstances to grow in your relationship with God. I ain't telling you what I think I know. I'm telling you what I know I know. Praise God if you believe the words of the songwriter that trouble won't last always because somebody in church once told me when praises go up, blessings will come down. No matter how difficult a situation may be in your life, Jesus is reminding us in this text that our primary purpose as members of the church, in season and out of season, through good times and bad, is always, always, always to give God some praise. To begin walking in your destiny then, the first thing we've got to realize is that we never should lose sight of who we are. The first point in this text, don't ever become so diluted by your circumstances that you forget or lose sight of who you are. You are God's children. The second point I believe we see from this early portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is that in order to walk in your destiny, hmm, you must let your light shine in the midst of your situation. Let your light shine in the midst of your situation. 
When we look at this text now, again in verses 14 and 15, Jesus says, watch this, you, I'm talking to you, you are the light of the world. And a city built on a hill cannot be hidden. But Jesus also tells us, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a bushel. Instead, you put it on a lampstand and give light to the whole house. Every now and again, my brothers and my sisters, we need, to be re we need to be reminded, rather, that regardless of our circumstances, the same Jesus who was physically talking to the body of believers back then is the same Jesus who is spiritually talking to us right now. Jesus is telling us in this text to use what God has given you as your way of glorifying God. After all, it's God himself who lit your light, and all of us should do a little bit like the songwriter. Hmm? Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. God lit a light to shine in tennis through Venus and Serena. God lit a light to shine in politics through Barack Obama. But God also lit a light to shine in life through Y-O-U. Use whatever God has given you in 2020 because now is not the time to put your light under a bushel because you can easily be overcome by forces of darkness. Let me put it to you like this. I'm going to be the bearer of bad news for about a hot second. Hmm? C.T. Vivian is gone. He's not coming back. John Lewis is gone. He too is not coming back. God is not going to give us another Fannie Lou Hamer. God is not going to give us another Rosa Parks. That's because God has already given us Y-O-U. Here in 2020, God may have given you a light to write letters to the editor. God may have given you a light to raise funds to help somebody who's running for office. But if John Lewis's life was not in vain, please remember like you never remembered before, please remember that God has also given you the right to vote. Vote like your life depended on it. Vote because forces of darkness are actively working against sending blacks forward to Congress because they want to send blacks backwards to cotton fields. Vote because some imperial dictator who says it is safe enough to send your children back to school who also had the nerve to tweet that it's not safe enough for us to vote so we should postpone the election and let me continue sitting on this throne. I'll be a monkey's uncle. Vote because if black lives really do matter in 2020, it's time to have something more than just a slogan on a court for NBA players and trying to do something more than saying lift every voice and sing before NFL games. Vote because we've got to reform law enforcement agencies. Vote because all across America, we've got to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. Vote because we've got to put an end to racial discrimination. Or instead of ever becoming united, we will remain the divided states of America. Vote, my brothers and sisters, like your life depended on it in November. Vote and get people to come out for the census. Vote by walking in your destiny. Vote by letting your light shine in the midst of your situation. Vote. If John Lewis lived for anything at all here in 2020, vote! The third and the final point I believe we see in this biblical text. Jesus is calling on us all to be a witness and to tell somebody else, said the preacher. The choir already knows. Tell somebody else about the goodness of God. When we look at this text in verse 16, Jesus tells us to let your light so shine before others so that they can see your good works and give glory to your father, not give glory to you, give glory to your father in heaven. Let me put it to you like this. I watched President Obama's eulogy of Congressman John Lewis. He shared that after his first inauguration, he went over and he hugged Congressman Lewis and said, I wouldn't be here today, John, if it wasn't for you. That tells me as we think about and apply this text to the progression of black America, Jesus is telling us in this text that overcoming our obstacles and persevering through our circumstances means letting our light shine before others by telling somebody else the story 
Because at the end of the day, it's God who gets all the glory. Oh, I don't know about you, but I've been black a mighty long time. And I'm proud to tell somebody the story of General Colin Powell. Because by telling his story, it's really God who gets all the glory. I want to tell somebody the story about Madam C.J. Walker. Because telling about her story means it's God who gets all the glory. I want to tell somebody the story of C.T. Vivian. The story of Denise Nash, of Diane Nash, the story of Andrew Young, and the story of Ella Baker. I want to tell somebody the story about Sister Virginia Williams and the story about Brother Mickey Michaud. Tell somebody about how they gave their lives to be of service to others because by telling their story, it's always God who gets the glory. Oh, I believe Jesus is telling us in this Sermon on the Mount that we all are called on to live our lives in such a way that we can walk in our destiny and give God the glory by living out our story. Give God glory by living a life that is pleasing unto God. Give God glory by giving of yourself and giving the precious gifts God has given to you unto others. Give God glory by being a witness of praising the fact that when praises go up, blessings will come down. When praises go up, blessings will come down. When praises go up, blessings come down. And as members of the church, telling the story means always taking time to praise God. I want to close now by circling back to where I began. I shared with you in the beginning of this preaching moment that my mother was able to walk in her destiny. And even though she's no longer on this side of glory, I have a physical reminder of her in the form of her wedding ring. That physical reminder will always point me inward to my heart because I know my mother's love will always be with me. Last week, and again, listening to President Obama's eulogy of John Lewis, as the former president talked about John Lewis attempting to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, on the day that we will forever know as Bloody Sunday, March the 7th, 1965, I had a visual of that bridge and the backdrop of young John Lewis. That bridge, regardless of whether they change the name or not, that bridge will always be a physical reminder of the fact that the boy from Troy had the courage of his convictions and believed enough in democracy that he was willing to risk his own life so black America could have the right to vote. That physical reminder will always be there to direct us inward to the fact no matter how bad your situation may be, God is always watching over. This morning, as we prepare now to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, we recognize that Jesus said, do this in memory of me. That means although Jesus' literal body is no longer with us, Jesus left us a physical reminder of his mercy and his love. That is the sacrament that we will partake today. That means on this day of celebration, because of Jesus, and because Jesus was able to walk in his destiny, all of us are given the gift of everlasting life. That means regardless of what we do or don't do on this side of the River Jordan, because of Jesus, all of us will ultimately walk in a divine destiny too. I love you, and I thank God for you. We all have a, a destiny. We all have a purpose. But we can't fulfill that destiny or purpose without Jesus. So this moment, this opportunity.